Um, so, so the title of the talk isn't, isn't actually what to build, it's what to work on. Uh, my name is Chris McAvoy, that part was correct. Um, and it, it's kind of an important distinction between the two things, right? It's, one is sort of like, I'm telling you what to build. Uh, and this is really a talk about uh, how to decide what to work on, right? Um, and it's totally not technical. That's the, the secret of the talk. Like, I'm in management now, so I don't do things anymore. I just talk about stuff. Um, it's very touchy-feely. I will both touch your hearts and your, your souls. <laughs> uh, does anybody know what this is? It's a number. <laughs> Integer. But, but what is it? Do you know it? Do you know what common number it is? It's not really common, but like you, you run across it sometimes in programming. Anybody know? Number of seconds. I heard it almost. Yes. It's the number of seconds in a day, right? And uh, um, a cousin of mine actually one time said, uh, you get 86,400 seconds per day. You don't get to carry them over. You don't get to roll them over, right? That's all you get in a day. And you never get them back, and so you have to make them count, right? It was like a, it was an inspirational speech. So the point is, is that this is all you get, right? So why would you want to work on, on things that you don't want to work on, right? You only want to work on important stuff. So what I'd like to be able to do is, and what I encourage my team at Threadless to do, is to um, not work on things you don't want to work on. Right? It sounds easy, but it can be really difficult to, to, to convince other people that that's the way you should do things. So I've got some basic, simple ideas of tools to, uh, to kind of help you get around that. So we do have a plan. Um, the first step is to know who you are, right? Second step is to know who you aren't. Also. One thing I know about myself is I love the flame effect in Keynote, so I can guarantee you, you will see it quite a bit. Know your constraints. One of my constraints is using the flame thing. Uh, make decisions, right? It sounds obvious, but it, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how, how, how difficult that can be for people. Uh, and then once you've made the decision, watch for, for red flags. And I'll point out a few red flags. And then ultimately, this entire presentation is complete and total garbage. And I'll explain why at the end of the presentation. So who you are. Um, I'm going to describe who Threadless is, right? Not myself so much, but the company that I work for. How many, how many people own uh, Threadless t-shirts? Right? How many, is anybody wearing one right now? No? Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> well, the, the point is like yeah, almost half of you own a shirt, right? It's because you people are our people, right? Like this Know Your Nerds shirt, like, thank you, nerds. Like you, you've, you've basically created a t-shirt company. Uh, and it's, it's really owned by the community, largely because we are a t-shirt company, we sell t-shirts. But the way it works is, is uh, our design community, uh, people just like yourselves, uh, submit a design, right? And then the rest of the community votes on all of the designs. And then the top vote getters become t-shirts, actual products, right? And if the t-shirt is really particularly good, like it'll show up on TV and be worn by famous people and everybody wins. Uh, if you're not very good at designing shirts or design, um, you can also submit slogans. A lot of people don't actually know this, but you, if you go to threadless.com slash slogans, you can just submit like your quirky one-off ideas. And they're voted on just like regular shirts. And then the top vote getters uh, are made into shirts by professional artists. So a couple. Um, Maybe a year and a half ago, um, we started to, uh, the company was sort of affected by a series of disasters, right? So Katrina hit, um, one of our, uh, one of the guys in the art department was, uh, lived in New Orleans, was from New Orleans. Um, a lot of the design community was from there, so we, we did a, um, 
a shirt for Katrina relief. And then not too long after that, we did uh, this shirt for uh, Haiti. Um, and then we did a, a shirt for the Gulf Restoration Network uh, for the Gulf oil spill. And it, it became a trend, right? We, or not a trend, trend is the wrong word, but it became a, a pattern that the company really liked doing these shirts and then taking the, the proceeds and donating them to, to relief of, of the particular disaster or event or charitable organization. So we, we split it off and, and created causes.threadless.com, which actually also plays a pretty significant role in, in some of the decisions that we made that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but this was also uh, the first app that we did completely in Python. So I, I started at Threadless a year and a half ago. Um, I am a little bit of a Python zealot, and over time we decided to, to go with Python. Um, we still have a significant PHP code base, um, but most new development now is done in, in Python. And actually this is also pretty interesting. Like the, We did a Japanese relief uh, for the tsunami and earthquake. And we got that up within a couple hours of, of us hearing about the disaster. And we had submissions rolling in like that evening, which, uh, you know, our artist community is, is pretty particular, uh, or not particular, but um, uh, they care about what they're putting together. It takes them a lot of time. So that meant that like a lot of the submissions were probably already being worked on before we put up the challenge. Um, so. We just have a very, very active community. We have a very active community that wants us to be as engaged with them as they are with us. So we have to be able to move very quickly. We have to be able to do the kinds of things they want us to do. Uh, and then we just, just released the shirt um, that ultimately we decided on from that uh, design challenge this past Thursday. So we are, this is, uh, I just have a couple of slides of our workspace because I'm kind of proud of it. But we, we just moved into a new building in the West Loop over here. Um, this is the tech department. We went for a theme of uh, old video games. Yeah, Pac-Man. We only use the best operating systems. That's a joke. It's okay, you can laugh. There's windows in there. I asked, I asked somebody from, from our art department to take some pictures of the workspace for this presentation, and he sent me a bunch of the pictures, and this was in, this was like one of three pictures that he sent, and it was like, I, he doesn't know. I mean, you know, he tried his best, but like our one guy, our one developer who does most of his stuff on Windows, he captured his, his, his desktop. It just killed me. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Flourish. <laughs> But to, to make up for it, I took a screenshot of my desktop, and I, I, am, I am sort of a Linux user, like I do everything in VMware, and I just recently started doing uh, uh, Linux as my main like work environment desktop, and I switched to Xmonad. Is there any, are there any Xmonad people? Yeah, there's always just one. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, and I, and I also opened up specifically uh, an Emacs window just to prove that like not only do I like difficult window managers, but I also like difficult text editors. <laughs> so that was the who you are section. So I so the, the summary for you guys right is to just sort of to um, you have to be self. How how many people are students here? I probably should have asked this before. Holy cats! All right, so you guys are constantly rediscovering yourselves. Um, so is everybody else sort of like, how many people are like developers, sysadmins, uh, just like hackers, uh, hardware, hardware, software, both, all right, <laughs> just like configuration files. <laughs> Yeah, you, I mean, you just have to be able, you have to be honest with yourself about who you are. And, and along those lines, you also have to be honest with yourself about who you aren't. Can you see this picture? This shirt came out uh, a couple days ago, and it blew my mind. It's Abraham Lincoln dressed up like Link from Legend of Zelda. And we made that as a shirt. Flames. I, I actually hate this topic. I hate it really bad. Because who wants to talk about who they aren't, right? That implies that I can't be whatever I want to be. But unfortunately, it's kind of the truth. So you have to sort of be honest with yourself. But ultimately, haters going to hate, right? You can't. 
Like you, you can't, you can't let people get you down. Don't get me wrong, but you have to know where the lines of you begin and end. Okay. And I think the best way to do it is is really to rely on data. Like let let data. I, I, for anybody who's worked in in sort of like a, a computing environment, occasionally you'll get to a point where nobody can decide on anything. So uh, one negotiation tactic is to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants to come in and tell you who you are, right? Uh, you can do that personally too by relying on data. Like data is objective. Data won't hurt your feelings. Like you can, you can ascribe your feelings based on the data, but ultimately like data will never shoot you wrong. So rely on data as much as you can. Be humble about yourself. Don't like run around saying you're awesome all the time because everybody will know that you're full of it, right? And ask for feedback as much as possible. Like people will, if they're your friends, tell you who you aren't. Hopefully they'll be nice about it. Uh, and then we get to the constraints portion of, of the evening. Um, does everybody know the book, uh, The Mythical Man Month? Very popular book, right? We, we don't have to raise our hands anymore. It was just a, a thing for a little while. But Mythical Man Month, classic uh, software engineering book. Uh, Frederick uh, P. Brooks, the guy who wrote it, also uh, just published maybe a, two or three years ago a series, a book of, of his collected essays. And one of them is, uh, one of the essays was called Constraints Are Friends, which is just a great title. But uh, like a lot of good designers or artists or developers or architects or whatever, he believes that uh, constraints may be burdens, but they also may be friends. Constraints shrink the designer's search space. By doing so, they focus and speed design. So the point he's making is that uh, if you know the edges of the problem, then, then it's a lot easier to find solutions to the problem because they'll be squarely within the edges. You don't have to go looking all over the place, they're just, they're, they're in there, they're in that box. Um, and he also uses, he goes on to, to, to give a couple examples of, of great uh, artists and designers who, who, who saw constraints as their friend. Um, one of them I thought was particularly good was uh, Bach, J.S. Bach, not one of his like 15 sons. Uh, began his career in the patronage system. So he had a patron who would sort of demand things of him, you know, like do a symphony like this for my son or whatever. Um, and uh, as he like progressed in his career, he, uh, the constraints started to go away. But he realized that he wasn't able to really do good things unless he had constraints. So he would constantly uh, enforce these weird esoteric rules on himself. Like he had to spell his name in a symphony with musical notes, like put a BAC. Um, these are good examples. Now, identifying constraints, I mean, typically they're just flame, time, money, and quality. Um, a lot of times it's described as a, as a triangle. You can, uh, you can do two of them. Uh, you can get rid of one of them, but you can't get rid of two, and you certainly can't get rid of three. And it's always a good uh, conversation to have with somebody who's saying, uh, denying constraints, you could say like, well, we can't, we can't change the delivery date, right? And they'll always say yes, and we say, well, and our budget is pretty finite, right? And then you say, well, would you like us to lower the quality of the thing? They never say yes. So you're always just sort of leading them down this garden path, and then you stick it to them. <laughs> so we come to the decision part, right? Um, this is hard. Decisions are hard. Uh, and you can't really decide unless you measure. So at, at Threadless, uh, we use Pivotal Tracker. Does anybody know Pivotal Tracker? Uh, it's an agile project management tool that makes it very, very easy for you to um, define the, the things that you're working on, estimate them, and then as you uh, complete tasks, it, it tracks your, your, uh, the amount of effort that you've put into a project. So over time, you get this idea of your velocity, right? Which is the amount of work that you can get done in a set amount of time. Uh, and so, you're not going to be able to give anybody uh, an answer about what you can get done in a certain amount of time if you're not measuring it over, over time. So in, in our case, 
Um, we used this tool for probably six months, uh, rarely referring to, to the data that it was collecting. We would just, excuse me, um, track the data, track the data, track the data, track the data. Uh, and really now, uh, almost a year and a half later, is when it's really becoming valuable because we have a year and a half worth of data. So, so I guess the advice I would give to you is to um, constantly track, measure, and collect data because you'll have a use for it down the line. You might not realize it now, but like you will need it at some point in order to make a case for what you will or won't do as a developer or as a, you know, any kind of um, creative person. Uh, and then obviously plan, uh, and the data comes into play with the planning, right? But there's, there's elements of planning that uh, are overlooked a lot of times, right? And everybody wants to plan what they're going to get done, but nobody wants to, to ruthlessly cut, right? Like nobody wants to say, like, these are the things that we can't get done, right? Nobody wants to kill a unicorn. <laughs> I had to I had to redo the entire presentation today just to be able to fit this picture in because this the the, the uh, yeah for our April Fool's Day shirts, man. We we always go for these like the the shirts that we don't think anybody's gonna buy. Are you kidding me? How would you not buy that shirt? Like. Like we have failed as a company that we thought this was a goofy shirt. Like it is, it's already sold out, right? Within hours. I think people thought it was a joke. So like, ah, yeah, I'll play along. Bye, 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 bye. Anyways, I hate the phrase "man up," just so you know. But I, but it, it's it it's it's downplayed by the fact that there is a dead, eviscerated unicorn, cans of beer, two chainsaws, and what appears to be a ghost hat on the guy's head. <laughs> Yeah, but, the, but to the point, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted by how awesome that is, but the ruthlessly cut, right? Like, it, you can only get so much done, okay? Uh, if, if, if and, and this goes as much for yourself as for, so if, if you are sitting uh, in a void planning out your day, uh, or what projects you want to work on, or, or what you, how you want to spend your 86,400 seconds. It's as important to ruthlessly cut things as it is if you're in a high-powered board meeting with the heads of state of the CEOs of crap, right? Like, you have to be honest with yourself about what you can actually execute. So if you can't, if you don't believe that you're really going to have the time or the energy or the enthusiasm to get something done, Maybe you should not do it, right? <laughs> this is such an unpopular talk. It's almost, it, I almost subtitled it being a grown up, but then I was like, that would be so jerky to do that. But it's the truth, man. Like, it is hard to make these decisions. It is hard to tell people, no, I can't do that. But you have to be, you have to be strong enough to say, we just can't get this done reasonably. So we're not going to do it. And if you'd like to increase our budget, we could. Or if you want to give me more time, we can. But if not, then it's just not going to get done. Unicorn stab. You also have to be able to define the end of a project. Too often, things are just sort of completely open-ended. Um, they'll run on and on and on. But even if, even if the end is just a checkpoint that says, this is the, the milestone of the project, or this is the releasable thing of the project, that's better than just having an open-ended, forever we work on this sort of situation. So once you've done that and you've sort of decided what you're going to work on, you have to monitor how things are going. Um, and there's, there's a couple of red flags, in my opinion, that sort of um, help you decide whether or not you have decided correctly or if you're making mistakes over time. Uh, one of them is recursion. And I just like the picture. Again, I, I get sort of distracted with the pictures, but a pizza eating itself, that's crazy. Um, but uh, but it, it, if you find yourself repeating yourself constantly, right, there's a problem. Maybe you need to do something different. Maybe you are wasting your life. 
Uh, maybe there's a way you can script your life to be better, right? Like, you know, just the, give control to the business users. They, they will put things into forums if you provide them a form. Uh, where's the help? So if you have the world's greatest idea and you're constantly asking people for help and nobody's helping you, you may be a redneck. Like you may, like you, 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 you may have chosen the wrong thing to work on, right? It's just a, a flag. Like if you, you know, if you are driven and you are working by yourself and you love every day, more power to you, man. Haters gonna hate, but it might be a sign that you should look for something else to work on. Um, are, can you swallow the, the thing that you bit off, right? Like, is it possible to break the project down into chewable chunks? If you have, if you said, we're going to do this thing and we will deliver it in six months, it's going to take six months before the first possible milestone. And somebody says, can you break it down into smaller deliverables? And you say, no, then it might, there's probably a problem, right? Because you're not going to the moon right? You're not building a building, unless you are going to the moon or you are building a building, right? You're just probably doing web development like everybody else. And if you can't break it down a little bit, that's a bad sign, right? You need to figure out how to break things down or just drop the project. And focus, I just wanted, again, wanted to include the picture. So to emphasize focus, this guy's got a space shuttle, clocks, birds, skulls, and bleeding eyes. This guy had no focus when he made this shirt. Zero. He was just like, I'm going to put a thousand things that I like into a shirt. And I bought it. I love it. But to the point, I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> yeah, but you know, seriously, like if, if you end up, if, if you personally are having trouble focusing on something, it's probably a bad thing. If you're having trouble getting other people to focus on things for you, it's probably a bad sign. Like, if you're not passionate about a project anymore, eh, you know, man, maybe it's just not the thing to do. Try to find somebody else to do it, or just try to make a case for not doing it anymore. It might not be worth it, right? Like, we have this problem at Threadless sometimes. Like, we will define something, and it will, um, so in, in Pivotal, there's this thing called the ice box, right? So, the ice box is where things go to die. So you, you've like defined this project, you throw it into the ice box, and then it sits for six months, or it sits for three months. Look, man, nobody's nobody's focusing on it. Just throw it out. Like, don't. Why have that psychic burden? It's just sitting there making everybody cry. Occasionally, there'll be a meeting, and somebody will be like, "Hey, notice that that thing's been in the ice box for six months." Well, I don't know. Delete it. Like. Does it really bother you? And delete it from your lives. See, that's where the, the touchy-feely part comes in. <laughs> uh, beat the market. Did you see the one pig is pooping coins? <laughs> He's so scared. Yeah, markets rule. So this is this is an actual. This is the only actual graph that I have in here that that illustrates a real thing. The, the, um, the red line is the NASDAQ, okay? The blue line is the portfolio that I made up of stocks. I can't beat the market, right? Like, the, the point is, is that uh, the market is a bunch of smart people buying and selling things, right? It is very difficult to individually pick stocks that can outperform the collective intelligence of the market, right? And the same goes for just about everything in the world. So we, to bring it back to, to Threadless specifically, we, um, we run our own warehouse, okay? We, half of the company, half of the employees in the company are warehouse workers. We take the warehouse very seriously. Like the first week that you work at Threadless, you work in the warehouse. Um, we realize that we can beat the market at warehousing, right? Like we, there are, um, there are third party services that you can go out there and you say, okay, here's our 12 gajillion thingamajigs. Um, when an order comes in, we will send you the order. Please put the thingamajig in a bag and ship it to the address that we include, right? 
Um, it turns out that those places can't do that as well as we can because everybody in our warehouse actually cares about the shirts, right? So like they'll occasionally like write notes and do funny things and put them in the bag and um, they do all, uh, they contribute an awful lot to the, the company culture. Um, they're they're mostly made up of, of folks that are sort of like our demographic. So they, they're very good at calling out uh, bad designs or poor products. They monitor the quality of the product that, that you just won't get from an outsourced operation, right? Um, we can beat them there. Where we can't beat them is in warehouse management software, right? So we've had our own, we have today, our own custom built warehouse management software. We wrote that. And you know what, man? Like, I, we spend a lot of time maintaining it, an awful lot of time maintaining it. And it is impossible for me to be able to build a development team in a web business that can write better warehouse management software than one of 27,000 warehouse management software products out there on the streets. Right, so we are actively looking to replace, if you're a vendor and you're watching this on the videotape, don't call me about it, but we are actively looking to replace all of our warehouse management stuff and, out, and, and outsource the software to a third party. Okay, so it, it, that's a case of like, we, we, did, we did this sort of examination of, we looked at ourselves, we said, yes, this is who we are. Running the warehouse is part of who we are. But no, we are not a warehouse management software development company, right? Know who you aren't. Oh my gosh, he's tying it back to his own presentation. Uh, know who you aren't. We're not that, so we're going to outsource it, right? So I, I did want to go through a, a pretty specific thing about um, a couple steps that we took that sort of illustrate, tie things together, how we made a few decisions. Uh, specifically about why we chose to go with uh, Python uh, for causes and ultimately for the, the rest of Threadless. Was anybody at PyCon? Oh, sorry guys. So this is, this is sort of a condensed version of the talk that I gave at PyCon. The one thing I will say is I swore a lot in that talk. I've watched videos of it and I'm embarrassed. So I, I you haven't heard any swears. Yay for me. <laughs> Uh, so this was this was data that we took over time. So there's the first swear. Hey, um, what we realized. I wish I could. There's probably no way to. I'll just point. This is this is it's made up data. But but if I were to show you the real data, it sort of bears this out. And a lot of it is sort of. Um, anecdotal based on before we started tracking data, right? But there was an era in, in the company's history where we were producing a lot of features at a very rapid clip, right? So this is, if you, if you look at like the why, oh yeah. Thank you very much. So it, this, the, the Y axis is, is, shit we did. The uh, x-axis is over time, right? So like in the early days of the company, we were producing a lot, right? But then at some point, it sort of like petered out. It leveled out. And what we realized is that when we dove into the data and we looked at the big chart, again, totally made up data, but but what we realized is that we were spending like 17% of our pretend made up data time. There's actual data behind this, but like if I showed you actual data, that's boring. I can put funny things in the, in the, the thing if I just make the data up. 17% um, of our time on things that make a difference. We do play a lot of video games. That's why that one guy has Windows installed on his machine. Uh, so like, you know, we gotta have time for video games, but we were spending a huge amount of time just on, on crap, like things that just really don't drive the company forward, don't make anybody happy, are, are just a waste of time. And this is uh, kind of the list of things that we were doing. Um, we had like three different, or have three different caching systems, uh, two of which are homegrown. Um, accessing the database, like we, we have uh, tons of embedded SQL in classes and uh, we don't really use an object relational mapper despite the fact that it's been something that's, you know, a standard operating procedure for most web developers for a very long time. 
uh, we're constantly fighting with our templates, right? We use a mix of smarty templates and some is just embedded PHP, right? Like it's just, yeah, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Like it's very difficult to estimate a, uh, a piece of functionality because you don't, you don't, you're not entirely sure which area of the code it's going to end up falling in, right? So like you would get stuck um, doing a one-off estimation for somebody in the hall thinking that it was the new code, but in reality, it's the old code, and then it would just bite you in, in, the, in the butt. Oh, I almost swore. Um, searching, right? Right now, if you go to our website and you try to find that Man Up t-shirt, you will have a very difficult time doing it because our search system stinks. It's terrible, right? This is a secret. Carl will edit that part out of the videotape. But it's really bad because we wrote our own search stuff right and that's it's just not sustainable in the long term there's tons of open source packages that do search great there's tons of uh third party commercial uh e-commerce focused search things that do great and we are moving to one of the open source ones um with a little bit of flavor from the e-commerce stuff but we realized that we were just spending a huge amount of time like fixing these little crubby bugs with with search and writing a pagination class. Are you kidding me? It is 2011 and we are fighting with a pagination class? That was it, man. I took a two week vacation and I was like, I am not coming back until I figure this out because that is crap. You can't do that. This is like, a, this is such a specific red flag here. Look at that. <laughs> If you if you were doing sprint planning and they're like, well, we got to, anyways, you get the point. It was, it was awful. So what did we do? Um, we, we, um, we brought this gentleman. Does anybody know who this guy is? Yeah, so he's, he, he's Jacob Kaplan Moss. He's the, uh, one of the creators of, of Django. And he's now a consultant and he does very good training. So we brought uh, Jacob in for a week. Um, I should probably, there, there should probably be another slide in here that says that we also considered a, a, like a slew of, of um, uh, modern web frameworks. Like I wrote a little paper on modern web frameworks and what we should expect from them and we did our own sort of like matrix chart that listed all the different web frameworks and the things on the top and put X's for things that they had and nothing for things they didn't have. I mean, you know, you got to be slightly corporate even if you are a t-shirt company. Um, and at the end of the day, we were like, we're, we're going to go for Django. So we, we messed around with it a little bit ourselves. And then we have um, 11, 11 developers on the team. Uh, and, and we realized, like, we, we should just get training. So this is one of those areas where, where I believed wrongly that we had the constraint of, well, you know, we, we have to modernize the web framework, but we're just going to have to learn it on our own. Like, I, I'm used to this sort of, like, DIY-edness um, that I'm sure a lot of you are as well. But it turned out that the company was totally willing to hire the guy to come down and do training. And it was awesome. You know, he spent a week with us. We learned a lot about Django. We convinced him to, to do one of our uh, modeling gigs, and that shirt was a top seller because he just really, really brought the eyeballs to the site. Um, so it's easy, right? Well, it, not really. Um, it's difficult. We have we have some pretty serious like safety rings that we use on stuff. Um, we haven't, uh, apart from causes, we haven't deployed uh, uh, production Django code yet. We're we're scheduled to this week. Um, there were there was a lot of resistance from our our uh, hosting uh, partners. Um, to, to move away from PHP, not really resistance, but just sort of like they had to get up to speed on things. We had some resistance. It was a, it's been a difficult transition. Um, but after the fact, we're now business BFFs. So it always takes a minute. I hate this one. I really don't like the picture. It grosses me out. I have a three-year-old. I watch puppet shows. This is, this is sick. <laughs> uh, and so how conversations used to go with the, the business, like, can we do this good idea? And the, and the thing that I said at PyCon about this slide, too, is that, like, good idea is genuinely a good idea. Like, there was, never, there was never a time when the business came to us and said, we want to do this thing, where we were like, that is a terrible idea. 
Like seriously, business people, is that what you do during your day? They were always good ideas. We always wanted to do them, but we would always be like, yeah, I mean, we can, but we got to figure it out, and we don't know what template system it is, and it just always, it was like this like blah, blah, blah cycle. Doug, you're a roadblock. Ah, you don't understand technology. Draw your sword. And we would fight. How they go now? Can we do this good idea? Yes, we can. <laughs> Which isn't exactly true, right? Like we're we're in a transitionary period. Like it's uh, it's hard. Like we're doing a gigantic rewrite of our site. Um, we're doing it in in a measured sort of like do a page here, do a page here, do the overarching systems, things like that. Um, but it isn't all unicorns. Occasionally we have to kill those unicorns. Like it is, it's difficult. Like it's always going to be about that uh, ruthless prioritization, right? Like you can't do everything all the time. You can't keep everybody happy all the time. The, the quicker everybody sort of realizes that, the, the more realistic the conversations can go. And we are tremendously lucky at Threadless to have a very uh, technology technologically astute business unit. Like those guys really do understand, like we are an e-commerce business. They understand what we do. I can talk I can tell them that there's problems with the database and sort of like get into a little bit of detail. And they they nod and and ask questions that make sense, right? Like they know what we're talking about. Um, and they're very understanding of us saying like, hey, we need to take time to redo the web stuff. Um, they are not like a Dilbert cartoon. We're, we're very fortunate. And so this is the section that I talked about where, where this all sort of falls apart, right? Like the, it's all well and good, the whole front of it, but the fact is is that this is where Threadless was started, right? Like um, it was started by this guy, uh, Jake Nickel here. Uh, we are a 10-year-old company. I don't know if anybody knows that, but but it, we, we get lumped in as a startup in Chicago all the time. We are not a startup. We are an actual company. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we've been around for 10 years, man. Like, we, we've got a book. That's a book that he's holding over his head about the first 10 years of Threadless. Um, if When he started the company, he was a student. Uh, he went to... Uh, he was a uh, big into this one message board. They had a design challenge. He won the design challenge. And he took the money and he rolled it right over into the idea of like, hey, let's do this all the time, right? Now, if he would have seen this presentation, because I'm such an effective speaker, it's possible that Threadless never would have existed, right? So like for all of the things that I'm saying about this, like if nobody does it with you, maybe it's a bad idea. If this is the thing, maybe it's a bad idea. There's always a counterpoint. And I happen to work for a company that was based on a counterpoint to everything I'm just saying. I'm such a corporate stooge, man. But the point is, is like these guys will always blow the doors off of everything. So occasionally you have to just like stick it to PowerPoint and just do what you're going to do. And to prove it, that's Jake uh, a week ago teaching a class at Harvard. He's a, dro he's a dropout. Not only is he a dropout, but he dropped out of art school, right? <laughs> and these are all of, where's the laser pointer? This guy goes to Harvard. <laughs> and he's like, hey, I'm going to take notes on what he is saying. That's a win. Come on, let's clap. Come on, I went clapping. <laughs> but to put it more succinctly, one of the team, one of the guys on my team, is being a grown-up is fucking bullshit. And that's everything I got right there. <laughs> um, I did. I meant to put in a, a slide at the end that said uh, that we are hiring. I forgot. Uh, Threadless.com/jobs. We're looking for developers. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions about this talk, I'm happy to, to respond to them. Uh, if not, please do come to the party tomorrow night. It'll be a lot of fun. It's going to be in our, uh, our atrium, which is world renowned uh, for being a cool atrium. Um, we, Threadless is, is unique uh, in Chicago. 
uh, business culture for probably having the only uh, on-staff graffiti artist like doing the walls. Uh, we got like a cool Airstream thing you can look at, and we will have beer and probably pizza. Uh, so yeah, come on down tomorrow night, seven o'clock, twelve sixty West Madison. You do have to sign up on Eventbrite, or our bouncers will bounce you away. I'm sorry. Thank you.